Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. It is a blessing of God to be here and I thank God for this opportunity and I believe God has something very special prepared for us tonight in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We already heard a lot of awesome messages and I think if we apply half of what we heard we can flip our world upside down. But because we still have one more night we'll just take a little bit more time and prepare our faith for what's about to happen tonight. Uh, as some of you already have heard we're going to pray for the sick. We're going to pray specifically for people who have um, some issues that they cannot resolve with the help of doctors, medicine, counselors and other things that we will trust the Holy Spirit for His divine intervention in people's lives. Amen. God is not done with miracles. He's still yesterday, today and forever the same. The idea that Jesus healed people only to prove that he is God is completely weird because uh, I saw a good friend of mine Jacob over here when he plays piano. He doesn't play piano to prove that he has fingers. Though playing piano does prove he has fingers. He plays piano because he loves playing piano and making music. Jesus did not heal people to prove that he was God. Though it proves he is God but his motive was always compassion and love for the hurting people. God always loved the sinner and hated the sin. God always loved the sick and hated the sickness. God always loved the cursed people and hated the curse. God always loved the demon possessed people and hated the demons. Our God always loves people and He loves the sick and He loves to help us. I know sometimes we, we pray for the sick. We, when we are sick ourselves and we pray for a certain time and after a certain time we just give up. And it's not right to do that. The only time you should give up is when God gives you a word like he gave to Apostle Paul. Don't ask me for this. My grace is sufficient. But if God doesn't give you a word you have to stand on his promise and you'd only stop when you get the victory. Not when you get tired. Can somebody say amen? And then we will see the results and the blessing of God. Uh, all the promises of God, the promises of healing, they are like cement. They must be mixed with water. They must be mixed with our faith and today we are going to just do that take a few minutes and just encourage our faith toward what is going to happen tonight in Jesus name. When it comes to faith, faith is a very complicated subject and sometimes when you come to church it gets a little bit even more complicated uh, in church but faith is supposed to be very simple. The story that I uh, heard once that really helped me to kind of bottle down what faith is, is a story, I'm not even sure whether this story is true or not. It's a story about one man who was going through, they put a uh, rope over the Niagara Falls and he was walking over the Niagara Falls. He walked once and everybody cheered and after that he got, he got blindfolded and he went over Niagara Falls blindfolded on the rope. After they removed the blindfold everybody was really impressed and really just, just taken in awe by how he was so brave. And he took the wheelbarrow and took the wheelbarrow over the Niagara Falls and that's when everybody got super, super excited. After this he asked people a question. He said, does anybody believe that I can put a person in a wheelbarrow and carry that person across the Niagara Falls? What do you think people responded? Yeah! And then he asked the question, do I have any volunteers? <laughs> See that is faith. Now when you believe that God can take a wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls, it's when, God, when you believe God can take you in the wheelbarrow across the Niagara Falls. That is faith. Faith is not intellectual agreement with the promises of God. It's a heart trust and confidence that He won't fail you even when it's hard. It's very simple. It's not an emotion. It's a position of the heart that trusts and rests and rests in the promises of God. And though He slay me yet I will trust in one of the prophets says. That is faith. In the Bible some people had leaps of faith. Blind Bartimaeus, woman with the issue of blood, lepers and we see on and on and on people who took a very big leap of faith. For a moment they had this great faith in Jesus but you saw that Jesus constantly, the people who had the least kind of faith were disciples. And you don't see them experiencing miracles in their life but it's something very interesting that Jesus wasn't teaching disciples how to take leaps of faith. He was teaching them how to live a life of faith. And you don't see Bartimaeus, you don't see a woman with the issue of blood and you don't see 10 lepers doing anything for the kingdom of God in the book of Acts. Only people who had the most weirdest, weakest faith ever. And maybe you are here today and you're not one of those people who can take a leap of faith. You, you find yourself as a doubter. You find yourself constantly 
being afraid more than being actually in faith. I want to tell you something. God is not just interested in developing within you an ounce of faith for which you can snatch a miracle and then you can go and live your mundane life. God is interested in developing within you a life of faith that will not just bring a miracle into your life but make your life a channel for His power to touch other people, not just your life. Can somebody say amen? Faith. You know, some uh, 5,591 days ago, uh, my family immigrated to the United States. I was 13 years of age and when I came to the United States, I did not speak any English. I know some of you are like, man, you have an accent. Trust me. Some 15 years ago, my English was really, really bad. I would mix words up. I would, uh, it was just really, really terrible. And I understood one thing about this country that if you want to function in this country properly, if you want to get all the benefits and you want to be a benefit to this nation, you are going to have to learn English. Because you cannot be walking around with a translator all the time. You have to learn English. Otherwise you will get lost. Otherwise you won't know what to purchase. Otherwise you will not know how to return certain products. And, and most of you know that learning English is not that easy. There is no prayer anybody can offer where you can get English downloaded into your mind. I've heard of stories where missionaries learn a language supernaturally, but those stories seem not to happen to people who move to the United States. <laughs> Learning a language is not easy. That's exactly what faith is. Faith is the language through which you communicate with God. God doesn't speak Russian, God doesn't speak English, and God does not speak Christianese. He speaks faith. The Bible says he calls those things which are not as though they were. God's language is this. He looks at something that doesn't exist and he says it exists. A humanistic looks at it and says it's insane. It goes against our logic and God says that is how I am. God speaks faith. And many of us we come to church and we don't learn faith. We learn Christianese. Praise the Lord brother. God has been good to me man. But when we walk out of the church, the Christian news go out, goes outside of the window. Negativity, pessimism and everything that is not contrary with faith is our language inside of us, outside of us and everywhere else. And God wants us to be a generation who doesn't just take leaps of faith in which we can snatch a miracle or two. But we learn to live a life of faith. Develop a language of God, a language of faith. Somebody say amen. And this language of course is learned step by step as we walk with God. We go through trials, we experience miracles, we experience setbacks, our faith gets stronger and our faith gets more mature. If you have your Bibles, let's go together to 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 13 and 14. And I'm going to read from the New King James Version and it says the following, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, so Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. If you're taking notes, uh, you can title this simple uh, message that we are going to have. Anoint my head with oil. Now I know some of you may say, how can this relate with faith? Hang in there. We will get to this in just a moment. Let me ask you a question. When did David become a king? When he was a teenager anointed by prophet Samuel or when he was 37 years old and all the tribes of Israel gathered together and put a crown on his head. When did David become a king? Let's make it easy. A. When he was a teenager. B. When he was 37 years of age. How many of you in favor of A? Raise your hand. In favor of B? Raise your hand. Okay. Some of you noticed that there's many less, a lot less of you, the B ones. So you just, I must be wrong if there's not many of us who agree with this. Listen very carefully. Here is a young man and some historians or theologians, they say that he was about 15 years of age. He's shepherding a sheep and a prophet of God comes to him and says, takes the oil and pours oil on his head and anoints him to be a king. 
But you don't see the next day David occupying a throne. You don't see David in the palace next week. We don't see a crown on David's head right away. We see anointing on his head that makes him a king. Though he's just a teenager. And after he became a king, he didn't go to the palace. Actually, everything on the outside was still the same. It was the same sheep. It was the same brothers who always picked on him. It was the same father who always sent him on these crazy errands. Everything was the same and nothing was the same. Because a young man became a king. Something happened on inside. A supernatural magnet was placed inside of David. What when a lion would come? A normal shepherd would run for his life but a king trapped in a teenager's body runs after a lion and kills a lion. And nobody's seeing that. No crown on his head but a king is inside. A bear comes in, a typical shepherd no matter how powerful he is he most likely is going to run for hiding but a king inside doesn't run for hiding he goes and kills the bear because inside David is a king. No crown, no palace, no army, no king's salary, no king's servants. Nothing on the outside indicates he's a king. On the inside, he is anointed to be one. He goes to run errands. Most of us went to do errands for our parents. But when a king went to run errands for his parents, he didn't just bring cheese to the commander of an army. He brought a stone into the head of the Goliath. Why? A king came to the field trapped in a teenager's body. A king started to attract a palace. He didn't go into the palace as a king first. He went to the palace as a musician. And see, there's many people who could have went to the palace as a musician. Why did he go to the palace as a musician? Because when you're a king and inside, it's a magnet that begins to attract the kingdom. There's a guy who's sitting on the throne. There's a guy who has a plan for his son to take the throne. But when you have a kingdom inside, there will be no devil in hell who can stop that. No king, no empire, no regime, no threats, no army can stop a man who has become something on the inside through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We see he becomes a commander of the army and eventually he gets kicked out. He gets framed. For trying to assassinate the king and take over the throne. Eventually king begins to kill anybody who comes in contact with David and takes his name and dumps it into mud. But when you're a king on inside and you're anointed to be a king, hell and high waters but your crown will be on your head. Saul died his sons died, everybody died because the king on his side was anointed. David did not become a king because he got a crown. He became a king because he got anointed. That's how God works all the time. Most of us, what we want God to do for us is this. We asking God for a crown, a palace, soldiers and an army. For some people, it's asking God even to touch a physical body. We ask God to change even our outward circumstances. And that's a noble thing to ask and it's important to ask. But we must understand the way and the manner the Holy Spirit works. Is many times the way God will do a miracle in our life is not first coming and putting a crown on our head. But coming and putting a king inside in your spirit. And sometimes the crown can come the next day, sometimes the crown can come next week, sometimes the crown can come next month and sometimes a crown like for David will come some 15 years later. 
It's dangerous to have a crown on your head without having one in your spirit. They, Saul had a crown on his head. Saul was taller than anybody else. Saul had a title. Saul had the army. Saul had the palace. The only thing Saul did not have is he wasn't a king. Because God from heaven said, you're no longer a king. He still had a crown. But when you're no longer a king on the inside, your crown is not just decoration. It's demonic. Because the Bible says demons started to torment him. He started to fall under pressure over the things that he had because he was not that on inside. Faith is when God's word creates a reality inside of your spirit that contradicts everything around you and you stick with that reality until everything around you lines up with that reality. Faith is when revelation comes inside and revelation is not insight. Insight is when you're reading the Bible and you, you get this cool thing that uh, this with this and with that and it comes up with a scripture and you get a sermon. That's an insight. That's not a revelation. Revelation is when on the inside a truth of God's word becomes so real it takes your whole inside and flips it upside down but you cannot make a sermon out of it. You can't. You know something happened and people ask you, can you share it? I can't explain it. Because faith is when the oil goes on your head and you become a king and there is no sermon about it. The only thing is this, is after this occurrence, after this revelation, lions die, bears die, Goliaths die, and King Saul dies and the crown ends up on your head. That's what happens. From the beginning God always worked like that. If you look in Genesis chapter 1 we see that God first made the light and four days later he made the sun. Most of us read it just skip, skip it through but I used to think the first first day when people ask me what was the what did God make on the first day? I was like God made a sun. But your Bible makes you to understand that God on the first day did not make the sun. He made the light and on the day four made the sun. God works completely the other way around because in our mind we say this in order to have light you have to have the sun and God says in order to have the sun you have to have light completely everything other way we see same thing with Abraham nobody becomes a father who doesn't have kids Abraham doesn't have kids and God comes to him and says you are a father oh and let's add little things to it of many nations no one becomes a father until they have kids. In God's world, nobody gets kids until he first becomes a father. Completely everything around. Joshua is facing a Jericho and the Jericho is fortified city. The Bible says the walls are very high and the Jericho doesn't want to surrender. And God comes to Jericho, God comes to Joshua and says, Joshua, I have given Jericho into your hands. All of its mighty men, they're yours. The interesting part is Jericho didn't fall. I think Joshua after this conversation was looking over and said, that's it, the, problem, the walls fell, nothing happened. The city fell in the spiritual world and it fell in Joshua's spirit. And only then Joshua took down the walls with the power of God. In our world, if you do right things, you become righteous. In God's world, you become righteous so that you can do good things. God always works the other way around. Faith is God's way. But it will conflict with your mind because your mind says put a crown on my head and then I become a king. God says you become a king and the crown will come. Can somebody say amen. Yeah. This applies also in the area of health. This applies in the area of ministry and this applies also to every area that we want to work with God. God works just like that. In my own personal life, some of you uh, know a little bit of my testimony is when I grew up as a younger person, I struggled with insecurity and I struggled. I was extremely shy. I was so shy of people. I was so shy to be talking to people. I avoided people. I was scared of people. And anytime I would get a chance to be around people, I was so awkward that people would just walk away. <laughs> it was very awkward. And people were awkward back to me. And I always blame people for that. I said if people would have been nicer, if they would have had nine fruit of the spirit and if everybody would have been as kind as Jesus, I wouldn't have these problems. 
So I was thinking if God can change people and then I won't have to worry about walking around feeling constantly ashamed, ugly, worthless and no good. And I always prayed for people. For God to change people around me. And then I realized probably that's not going to happen. I started to pray for God to change my physical appearance and for God to change my outside life. I asked God for gifts because when I tried to speak my Russian wasn't good, my Ukrainian wasn't good and my English barely was developing. So I thought if I could speak good maybe people will like me and that wasn't going really well. It was really really slow. I tried to sing, somebody says that the elephant stepped on my ear. <laughs> and so my singing, the ability to sing and write songs completely flashed out of the window. And saying verses, Sikhatvarenya in church was no longer cool so that, that I lost the window opportunity there. I guess now the spoken word is becoming cool so but in that time spoken word wasn't cool either <laughs> and I remember my prayer was this is God if you change my outward circumstances I will change the kind of man I have become on the inside for 13 years defeated worthless ugly and no good socially awkward afraid of people and just afraid of myself and these prayers went on and on and on and on until the Holy Spirit wasn't answering them and I started to begin to just kind of spending more time with God and God kept always going for my head. And I was like, God, I got this. You go take care of other problems that you left kind of in my life or you allowed to happen in my life and that's why I have this kind of a mind and this kind of a person on inside. They are the problem and you fix them, this person, I promise you, I will take care of myself. But that's not how it works. God knows if he puts a crown on the head of a man who's not a king, that crown kills him. He always works the other way around. And when God started to work on the inside of my spirit and it didn't happen over one night. I wish it would have happened like with David. But it's just simply the, the anointing, the revelation of God's word, who I am in Christ. And the fact that I'm a creation of God. And the fact that what you see today is not real me. The real me is some, somebody inside. What you see today is a skin stretched over a skeleton and after you bury me in some five years you won't even see the skin. The real me, the real value of a person is hidden by how much Jesus paid on the cross for me. And when all of these things begin to slowly penetrate and I stopped worrying about my circumstances, it was incredible. My grades went up through the roof in school. I started being liked by other people, it was weird. I could hold a conversation with another people and my, my speaking started to get better and I started to get, I started to see influence, the crown started to become something I was chasing was running away from me. But when the king came inside, the crown came with him. God wants to change you on the inside. If you are sick today, you may say, this has nothing to do with me. This is all jumbo, jumbo stuff. I'm sick and this cannot help me. Yes, it can. Because the reason why many people get healed in the moment when the anointing of God comes. But when they walk out, a sick mind will always attract sickness. Come on. A healthy mind will retain healing. I heard a testimony of a young girl. She was, not, she was in, in her 30s now so she was not a young girl but when she was two years of age and she was sitting on a horse and the photographer who was taking a baby, the, the pictures of her, somehow the, the flash from the camera spooked the horse and the horse jumped and this two-year-old two year girl falls from a horse on the rocks and receives a severe brain damage. Because of that she started to develop seizures and epilepsy. And as she grew up and these things would happen some every other day and they would be severe and so she would be in school and she would be shaking on the floor and shivering and became very embarrassing, unbearable and so she left the public school and started being educated at home. At the age of 16 they decided to do a special surgery on her thinking that they will undo the damage caused by the injury falling from a horse and that she will be better. During the surgery she suffered a stroke. Half her body became paralyzed. And things became worse and now instead of having seizures every other day she was having them every single day and from 16 on this person accepted this as her destiny and as her life and one day she was sitting on the couch and the 
person was praying on the TV and this lady that was praying for a TV was praying for the sick people and she had a word of knowledge and she said there's a lady who's sitting on the couch and he, she said that I see an injury something had to do with the horse and that you uh, suffered something with your head and God is healing you from that injury she didn't mention epilepsy anything of that but just said that God is healing you of that injury and this young lady something happened inside not the healing that happened first what happened is the word of God went in into her mind and started to flush out the idea that living 30 years in epilepsy was the perfect will of God for her and for the first time in her life she accepted the idea that maybe perhaps it is the will of God that by the stripes of Jesus I might be whole when she received that thing she immediately felt just, just this light, this electricity that went through her body. This revelation came inside that I'm a healthy person and God is healing me. 30 days passed after that and there was not one seizure. <laughs> well, if you would know the rest of the story, you wouldn't clap now. But after 30 days, when she was in the kitchen, seizures came back except this time it's as though all the 30 days of seizures were condensed to 30 minutes and they came on her she almost died and when she came out of those seizures she told her mom she said when I went into the seizures I couldn't control my body but I still could control my thoughts and she said and every demon in hell rose up against me and said God didn't heal you and she said in that moment I had 30 days to prepare my mind and to get my mind prepared and she says in that moment in the corridors of my mind she says with the help of the Holy Spirit I started to repeat this verse by his stripes I was healed she said it went against everything I've known because here's my body shaking and baking on the floor and my mind is saying I was healed she said when all of that ended she stood up and she said, mom, I was healed. When this testimony was recorded, it was seven years and this young woman has not had one seizure since. I want to tell you something that you have to get healed in your mind. What I mean by that is that God's word has to take precedence over your reality. Many of us have been bullied by our reality too long. Many of us have been subdued by our reality too long. And this is a time where God wants to change the reality on inside. We have a young woman here with us today who given her life to Jesus from our church about a month ago. And when she gave her life to Jesus right away, she also surrendered her, her drugs and uh, other things that she had going on in her life. And... I don't remember when I was talking with my wife on the same day on Sunday with her and she was mentioning that she was in a car accident four years prior and when she was in a car accident she was eight months pregnant and the car accident has brought such a trauma to her life that while she was talking about car accident she was shivering and shaking and she said ever since then it's been four years that I do not drive a vehicle not only I do not drive a vehicle but I am extremely terrified of being in one and I told her, I said, you know, God is going to set you free. But I don't ask you, please do not get inside of the vehicle until first God does something inside of you. I asked her to take a verse where the Bible says God has not given a spirit of fear but power, love and sound mind. And I asked her to get a notebook and I said, I want you to write this verse 1,000 times. So that the software in your mind can be changed. And so don't try to get behind the wheel first you have to inside of your heart there has to be a revelation that you're not a person that you grew up for four years to be and this doesn't happen always through prayer doesn't always happen through somebody laying hands on you sometimes it happens with you step by step putting God's word inside of you and pushing every other thing out Amen. you may not change your reality but you can change the reality inside by filling yourself with the promise of God and sometimes it's so hard especially when the revelation contradicts the situation but if you hold on to the revelation long enough it will change your situation but if you have a situation that changes but inside of you there is no promise of God you're like King Saul holding on to a crown for which you have no right for and this young woman last Wednesday actually she was getting baptized and I was upstairs and I I saw I 
a person pull in in the car and I thought it was someone else and I see her walking out of the car so I went downstairs and I said what are you doing I said why are you driving you didn't finish writing a thousand times of this verse yet she said I know I'm on the 900th time but she said it's been already a few weeks and I've been driving I said but I ask you not to drive until we first you know pray for you she says something happened inside that took away the fear on the outside God's promise must become the reality on inside and then your outside reality will have to line up to it that's why David says in Psalms anoint my head with oil you know why because he was with the sheep and he saw the sheep's biggest danger is not always lions and bears sometimes it's flies oh they're such a small creatures but they can do more damage to the sheep's life than even a lion or a bear because they would put these eggs that would hatch and the things from the eggs would go through the through their nose and and begin to damage their mind and their head and David would protect the sheep by putting oil on their head so anytime the flies would come that they cannot stick and they will have to fly out and the sheep's mind will be protected I want to tell you something today the Holy Spirit wants to anoint your head when you were born you came into this world out of another world most of you head first not your body your head comes first and then the rest of the body that's how you come out of every situation head first financially in health in our relationship with God most of us what we want God is we want God to drag the body and we say God then the head will come out and God says that's not how it works in Romans chapter 12 verse 2 it says do not be conformed to this world but be transformed it doesn't say renew your mind when your life is transformed it says renew your mind so that your life can be transformed out of every problem that you are in, God will remove you out of that problem head first. Can somebody say head first? <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, God's going to get you out. Turn to your other neighbor and say head first. Can somebody say amen? Sometimes we think that real humility is when we humble ourselves in our situation. The Bible never commends humility to a situation. God always says humble yourself under a mighty hand of God. It never says humble yourself under mighty hand of your sickness. It doesn't say humble yourself under poverty. Humble yourself under rejection. Humble yourself under curse. Hum humble yourself under oppression God always says humility and sometimes it takes a lot of humility to recognize what God is saying to be true even if it contradicts your reality can somebody say amen in the conclusion I'm going to read to you one verse from Exodus chapter 7 verse 1 it says the following so the Lord said to Moses see I have made you as God to Pharaoh and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet you shall speak all that I command you and Aaron your brother shall tell Pharaoh to send the children out of his land verse 3 and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt and then it continues on what happens with it's a similar thing that God does with Moses Moses come to the land of Egypt and God sends him to deliver Israelites out of Egypt and he has few simple miracles he has three miracles at his disposal that he really perfected one of them was kind of cool you put your hand inside of the bosom you remove it and it becomes white he did that Pharaoh was like awesome I'm not moved another one 
was what he did with water and another one is what he did with stick he threw the stick and it turns into a snake and Moses comes and does that and so in the court is impressed but nobody is moved the only thing that Pharaoh does after this is he says since Israelites have the guts and the audacity to come and dare to ask me to move out of my nation I am gonna go ahead and make their hardship harder and that's when Moses gets discouraged Israelite says Moses you gave a sword to Pharaoh to kill us get away from here and Pharaoh gets more stronger and Moses comes to God and does the thing that most of us do says God I didn't sign up for this I told you this is not gonna work this is not a good idea Pharaoh doesn't like me people don't like me you seem to not do anything you know what God I quit and you would think God would say oh, I'm sorry Moses let me help you let me just encourage you you know what God it seems to ignore completely all of his complaints all of the things that are happening God comes in the chapter 7 after all of that whining, and he says Moses I'll make you a God to Pharaoh God did you just hear what I just said the Pharaoh doesn't like me people don't like me and you your miracles they're not seem to work in this in this particular situation this is not going to work but God says Moses the reason it doesn't work is because with my miracles with my message you're still in your mind a slave when you walk into a court of Pharaoh I know you were trained there but you're walking in as a slave and Pharaoh smells a slave and he won't listen to a slave he says in the spiritual world I change your location I'm making you a God to him and I don't want you to walk in as a slave I want you to walk in I know this may sound kind of weird but it's in the Bible I want you to walk into his court not as a slave begging for freedom as a God commending another lesser God let my people go You know what the interesting part it was after that revelation that God gave him 10 plagues and if you study the Bible carefully you will see that in the history every single plague God did through Moses was directed toward a God in Egypt and after this revelation Pharaoh no longer was just bullying Moses he was being bullied and he was asking Moses ask your God please implore your God Pharaoh became a slave because Moses became the bully you've been bullied by the enemy too long anytime you're a slave on inside demons don't respond to slaves they respond only to authority you can be an ex-slave but if once that penetrates inside of you and you don't have to go on a high spiritual experience to get that revelation you can be at the lowest point of your life like Moses nothing is working out and at that moment God comes and says Moses let me in a spiritual world lift you up I am a God nobody messes with me and pigs produce pigs chicken produce chickens I made you and I made you in my image nobody walks over me and nobody bosses me and there has been nobody who rose up and lasted I know Karl Marx said there is no God and signed his name on it well good news is God said there is no Karl Marx and put his name on it I know Lenin rose up and says I'll put the last Christian on the TV and the last Bible will be in the museum last time I checked he is in the museum and it's about him they do the commentary and Christians are not the last and communism fell in a very Russia he sought to build it why because God is God he's a boss
you may be a young person inexperienced but when you are on his side God won't change a Pharaoh until he changes you until he changes you you may say well all of this this is just a good thing but the reality is well see until you remove reality out of being your God and put God as higher reality you won't see a change in your life that will last every change that will happen it will happen like this God touches it and then in a matter of few months you're going back to the same life until the Holy Spirit anoints your head when Moses became a God to Pharaoh you know what happened Pharaoh started to negotiate Pharaoh started to say Moses I will let you guys go but let the man only go but see when a man knows his authority he also knows never to make deals with the enemy and he doesn't stop Moses doesn't stop halfway I say oh yes praise God at least you let the man go oh, praise God Jesus oh thank you father at least the men are going at least the, I know the women are gonna go to hell and the kids are going to hell and our finances are going to hell our health is going to hell our pools are going to hell but the fact is they're just a man see when a man knows his authority he will push the pedal to the metal and he will get everything and not get one ounce to the devil left He won't stop with seeing one person saved he's gonna push it and push it and push it and the devil will negotiate but the person will not surrender and give up why because he knows if the enemy is negotiating that means the enemy is already been weakened and God will give us everything that he has promised if we don't give up we stand on his promise I understand some of you may be listening and you may say you don't understand my reality you don't understand my situation I'm sorry some situations I might not understand but I also know a revelation of God's promise and I want to tell you something that reality which you call so powerful thousands of years ago that reality didn't even exist that reality even came to the reality of the fact that there is a God over a planet who spoke the world into existence let's make him God over our reality. Faith is when God puts a crown, puts anointing on your head and there is no crown. I'm not in any way indicating that you receive the promise of God for healing and you go away, you throw away the medicine and you pretend that you're healed when you're not. But at the same time when your inside is penetrated, saturated with sickness and disease and defeat and unbelief and doubt and fear and you think by just coming and getting touched by a minister whoever that be even if Jesus Christ himself touches you he first wants to change your inner substance you will come out of this situation head first